Well, hi again, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today, we're kind of getting into the home stretch of this documentary, and today we're going to talk about the sun. We've learned that the stars are in the firmament, which is a dome over the Earth of unknown thickness or distance from the surface. We've learned that the moon gives out its own light, which is cold, and it has the unique property that you can turn off the lights over parts of it on a regular basis. Today we're going to learn a little bit about the sun, and I'm actually kind of looking forward to this because it's very interesting to me what they have to say about it as far as what it's made of, how far away it is, and how it seems to operate. So let's cue up the music and see what they have to say. Have you ever noticed that when you look out of an airplane window, you seem to be on the same field as the sun? Have you ever noticed that sometimes you can see clouds behind the sun? Have you ever noticed that the sun's rays disperse from a single point in the sky? This is because the sun is not located 92 million miles away it's actually much, much closer. The Bible says in Psalm 19, verses 1-4, through 4, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. According to these verses, the firmament is a tabernacle for the sun. A tabernacle is a tent-like structure, and God has placed the sun within that tent. The sun is located below heaven, beneath the firmament. Okay, so this brings up a couple of interesting points. The firmament is further away than the sun is. So if we can figure out where the sun is, we might have some idea of where it is in relationship to the firmament, would we not? Well, that would mean that the firmament, which is the second heaven, would be enclosing the first firmament, which is the sky. And if the sun is in the sky, it's like having a heater in a room. Wouldn't that warm up the atmosphere? If the sun was local, and those crepuscular rays pointed to where the sun was, we could triangulate it, couldn't we? Yet, when Blue Marble Science and I both tried to triangulate the sun, we came up with different locations of the sun, even though we were only about 500 miles apart. That's kind of inconsistent, but we'll let them go on. The world also tells us that the Earth orbits the sun. This is impossible because the sun was created three days after the Earth. Now, I'm kind of curious how that works because we can actually measure the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. We can document it. There's evidence for it. So, where's the evidence that we're not orbiting the Sun? Can you bring some out? And while you're at it, would you mind explaining the seasons to me? There was an Earth before there was ever a Sun to orbit. Psalm 19, verses 4 through 6 say, Their line has gone out through all all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So there's nothing hid from the heat thereof, which would follow if the sun was beneath the firmament. There'd be a lot of heat going on, wouldn't there be? I mean, if I have a heater in a small room, it heats the room up very quickly. So why doesn't the sun heat up the atmosphere just as quickly? And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. According to this verse, the sun has a circuit or circular route within the firmament. A good way to picture it is this. Imagine hanging a light bulb in the middle of a room. Then, imagine swinging that light bulb so that it goes in circles. 
That's what the sun is doing above the earth. It takes approximately 24 hours for the sun to make a full circuit over the earth. You know, I'm going to go ahead and stop you right there because I'm a little bit confused. Now, if you look at the sun, which is right here, the boundary between lightness and darkness is right here. If we go down this way, there's the boundary between lightness and darkness. Why is this light over here? Why isn't it kind of go like this? How does this whole side of this nice curved surface here get lit up if the sun's way over here? Did you guys ever think about any of this stuff? I'm just curious. Have you? How would you explain that? The light from the sun covers approximately one half of the earth. Seriously, man, you think my head covers half the earth? That looks like it covers about a quarter to a third of the earth. Why isn't the day half the length of the night? And again, isn't this closer to the sun than that down there? Come on, guys. The light from the sun covers approximately one half of the earth, while the light from the moon covers the other half. When the sun rises in the morning, that means that the sun is traveling towards us. At noon, the sun is directly above us, and in the evening, the sun is traveling away from us. This is why we feel no movement when we go outside. It is because the earth is not moving. Here's another one of those very inconvenient questions. You obviously understand what the world says the earth does. It's a sphere and it rotates. If you were standing in, say, Chicago, you say that we should feel a rotation. Okay. In what direction will we feel it? This circular pattern can be most clearly seen by taking a time lapse of the night sky. You can see the star's circular pattern over the course of time. Well, so tell me, those stars are moving in a clockwise direction. Are you looking north or south? And if you turn around, what direction will the stars be moving in? Now, I actually built a model of this once. I tried to figure out how I could make the stars move as they actually appear to move. And between them, of course, we have a celestial equator where they move in a linear fashion. So if we had a bowl on top of a flat earth that was rotating, wouldn't the stars by the horizon be moving horizontally instead of in a circular manner? And wouldn't they be the same in all directions? And the only place that would be actually rotating like this would be directly over the North Pole. What happens if we look south from Australia, or South Africa, or Tierra de Fuego in the southern tip of South America? Why do we see stars moving in a circular pattern in that direction if the bowl is centered over the North Pole? If it's not centered over the North Pole, where would it be centered, and how would it move in order to give us this pattern? The circuit of the sun also has a large impact on the weather. Here is a recording of the weather on a flat earth. You can see how the course of the sun directly impacts the weather in its wake. Okay, right here I see another quick problem. This is Australia and Sydney is about right here. The sun at all times on the earth is between the Tropic of Cancer in the Tropic of Capricorn. It is directly over these points on Earth all year long, somewhere in this red band. So tell me, why up here in Sydney, Australia, does the sun rise south of east on December 21st? How is that possible on your flat Earth, with the sun moving in a band right here? Wouldn't the sun always be more towards the north of east if it was up here? So how is it a fact that the sun is south of east at sunrise on December 21st? Now let's look at this next one because you got even a bigger problem right here. I'm going to pop out for just a second because I want you to see this really clearly. According to this legend, these are cyclone patterns over several years. You see where it says that right there? Now, in the northern hemisphere, cyclones 
rotate in a counterclockwise manner. And in the southern hemisphere, they rotate in a clockwise manner. Why is it that there are no cyclones over the equator? You see that? That's completely clear. Now the reason for that is something called the Coriolis effect. Due to the rotation of our spherical Earth, cyclones in the southern hemisphere rotate in a clockwise fashion. And in the northern hemisphere, they rotate in a counterclockwise fashion. If you had a cyclone rotating in a clockwise fashion down by Australia, and it drifted north up to the equator, Coriolis would stop the rotation because it would oppose the direction of rotation that it started off with. And eventually the storm would peter out. And that's why you see this huge gap surrounding the equator between the southern cyclones and the northern cyclones. Kind of cool, isn't it? Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Notice that Joshua told the sun and moon to stand still, not the earth. This is because the earth does not move. The sun and moon and stars do. So you'd have to be able to tell the difference between the sun and the moon moving versus the earth moving underneath a stationary sun and moon. Now, there's another problem that we run into. What's the altitude of the sun and the moon? Are they the same? If not, is the sun higher or is the moon higher? Now, if the moon is lower than the sun, there will be a solar eclipse every day. The sun would be blocked at some point by the lower moon somewhere on the earth. So how exactly would a lunar eclipse occur if the moon is below the sun? Wouldn't the sun shine on the top of the moon and cast a shadow below it? Because the sun has its own glory, right? Even if the moon is glowing itself, it would block the rays of the sun. That would be a solar eclipse. How would a lunar eclipse work in that situation? Or does the moon go higher than the sun? Just what's the geometry of that? I'm kind of confused about it. Would you mind drawing me a picture? God agrees to heal Hezekiah and gives him a sign to know that he will fulfill his promise. Isaiah 38 verses 7 and 8 say, And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. Now, for centuries we've used sundials to tell time. Is there ever a report of another sundial doing this, or was this a one-time deal? And how did this particular king rate to have that one sign done just for him? And why, of all the kings that followed him, did they decide not to do it for them? So I'm having a little trouble trying to believe this as being something that is gospel. Notice that it is the sun that returns 10 degrees, not the rotation of the earth. This is because the earth does not rotate. It is the sun that travels in a circular pattern above the earth. One of the most beautiful verses that disproves the idea that the earth is rotating around the sun is Revelation 8, verse 12. This verse says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. In this verse, an angel darkens one-third of the sun, moon, and stars, and the result is that one-third of the day is darkened. We are told that it takes approximately 365 days for the earth to fully orbit the sun. If this were the case, if God were to darken one-third of the sun, the earth would be in complete darkness for approximately 122 days out of the year and have daylight 
for approximately 243 days of the year. The effect would impact the Earth on an annual level, not a daily level. You are kidding, right? I mean, seriously? You can't really believe that, can you? On a flat Earth, however, Revelation 8 verse 12 fits perfectly. The sun does a full circuit over the surface of the earth every 24 hours. If God darkened one-third of the sun and one-third of the moon, there would be eight hours of darkness every day and eight hours of darkness every night, just like the Bible said. You do notice that that means that the day would have to be 48 hours long in order to do all this, right? You do notice that, right? Well, guys, I think this is one of the problems that I have with this creation story. They're reading something out of the Bible and then trying to make reality fit to what's said in the Bible. The day is not 48 hours long. This is completely made up of whole cloth. It has no bearing whatsoever on what actually occurs in the earth. How do you really argue with something like that or show that they're wrong because they know from personal experience that it is 24 hours from 12 noon one day to 12 noon the next day? This cannot happen because it would have to be 48 hours between two noons. Yet they still put out a video on the internet claiming that this happens. So, again... How do you argue with people that are in that much denial of basic observations of reality? I don't know. So next week, we're going to have a look at the foundations of the earth, and I hope they're going to talk about turtles. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you hit those little likes and subscribes and maybe have a look at a couple of the playlists that come up here in a moment. In the meantime... Have a great week, have a safe week, and I'll see you again.